Well, it is five o'clock and I think I'm going to get us started. Um, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Welcome to the music of Asian America Research Center's second virtual story circle. I have a brief introduction. Um, this is the second episode of a three part series. The last episode will be next Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern or 5 p.m. Pacific right here on Facebook Live. In this episode, four Asian American musicians will share stories about their lives, their family histories, and their professional experiences. A story circle is a methodology that allows us to explore how different people experience and respond to similar situations in ways that are both alike and distinctive. Our conversation tonight is based around four scenarios. After I present each scenario, each panelist will have two or three minutes to tell their own story based on that scenario. And afterwards, they'll have some time to react to each other's stories. Before myself and the Music of Asian America Research Center, or MARC. My name is Jennifer Wilson, and I'm a MARC board member. MARC is a two-year-old organization dedicated to using music to increase knowledge about Asian American cultures and open difficult questions about race, immigration, mental health and trauma, economic inequities, and many other issues. To learn more, please visit our website at asianamericanmusic.org or follow our Twitter or Facebook page. We will be releasing two podcast series and a couple dozen oral histories in the next few months. Um, in addition, we, are currently we currently have a call for contributors to write biographical essays on Asian American composers. I am the contact for these essays, so if you're interested in doing that, um, please look on our website for details. We have a modest honorarium and I'd love to work with you. One housekeeping note before I introduce our panelists, we know that closed captioning is running a little behind. We're trying a new service and we'll see how it goes. We also know that with any live captioning, there will be some mistakes. These problems will be fixed when we release the archive version of the session in a week or so. So now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists. Since this is a virtual forum, I would love each of you to wave a little when I introduce your name. First, joining us from Dallas is conductor Amanda Sue. Amanda is the director of orchestra at Curtis Middle School and the Philharmonic Orchestra Director for the Dallas Asian American Youth Orchestra. Joining us from the Washington DC area is musicologist Lauren Kajikawa. Lauren teaches at George Washington University and has written extensively about African American and Asian American hip hop and jazz. Tonight, we have two artists and musicians from New York City area. Zain Alam is a multidisciplinary artist whose work explores the lives of marginalized groups at moments of self-preservation, assimilation, and cultural innovation. And lastly, we have jazz woodwinds performer and composer Ben Kono. Also helping us tonight in the background is Eric Hung, Mark's executive director, and Mandy Magnuson Hung, Mark's board secretary, who will be monitoring the Facebook Live page to make sure everything is working. So our first scenario. In the next few minutes, I would love each panelist to introduce yourself and tell us about an object that has comforted you during the pandemic. I'm gonna start with Amanda. Hi, my name is Amanda Su. Um, I am a Chinese American orchestra teacher. Um, I was born and raised in Dallas and um, my parents immigrated to the United States um, a few years before I was born from Guangxi, China. Um, I'm the director of orchestras at Curtis Middle School in Allen, Texas, which is um, the nor northern suburb of Dallas. Um, and I have 350 kids in my program, uh, grades six through eight, and we have five different levels of orchestra plus our beginner classes. Um, and I am also the conductor of the Philharmonic Orchestra of the Dallas Asian American Youth Orchestra. 
Um, and we also have five groups in that, um, in, in that organization. Uh, the top two are full orchestras. So there's symphony and then I conduct the Philharmonic. So we're both full orchestras. And then we have the three lower groups, which are string orchestras. Um, and we have students from all around the Metroplex uh, come play in our orchestra. Um, you don't have to be Asian to be in the orchestra. Um, we just, we do, per we try to perform an Asian piece or by an Asian composer on each one of our concerts. Um, so that's a really neat thing that we do. Um, and I'm originally a violinist um, and I started violin when I was about five years old and um, I went to school for music ed. And, um, and now I'm an orchestra teacher and I just completed my 10th year of teaching. Hi, I'm oh. Lauren Kajikawa and um, I'm a professor of musicology and ethnomusicology at the George Washington University. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I'm a fourth generation Japanese and Jewish American. Um, so my mom's side of the family um, my mother's grandparents were immigrants from Eastern Europe, um, you know, fleeing persecution uh, from, you know, the pogroms in the late 19th and early 20th century. And my father's side of the family, um, my, his grandparents came, uh, you know, to Hawaii first, um, you know, as, as a part of the waves of, of immigrants uh, that were coming to, to work in the sugarcane and pineapple uh, plantations there. Um, and then my parents eventually um, both ended up in Los Angeles and met in Los Angeles in the 1960s. And, and then there's me. And my work focuses, um, I'm not, I'm actually unlike the other panelists where I'm, I'm actually wouldn't describe myself as a professional musician. I'm, uh, I, I've been playing a lot of piano during the quarantine, um, but I came to music performance pretty late. Um, not until I was really in college did I, start getting an interest in playing music myself, but music's always been an important part of my life as a listener. And I think always has been a lens for how I see the world. Um, that music has something to say about the world that we live in and that we can understand something more about history, something more about the way people relate to one another uh, through understanding music. And so I have, a, have come to music professionally as, as a historian and I have the good fortune at George Washington University to teach courses on the history of music, primarily in the United States in the 20th and 21st centuries. And my classes focus on issues of race, politics, gender, and um, other facets of human identity and how it intersects with musical practice. Um, and it's just always been a pleasure for me to be around musicians, around music, and to get to help students who are very interested in performance learn how to uh, connect their interest in, in playing music to an understanding of the world that they live in and their own their own personal experiences. So I sort of see that as one of my roles working within a music department. And yeah, I think some of the other things I'd like to talk about related to those, those questions will probably come up in, in later questions. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Great, Lauren. Thank you. We'll move on to Zane. Hi, everyone. Hi, my name is Zane Alam. I am a American musician of Indian and Pakistani origin. I was born in Flushing, Queens, New York City. And soon after, my parents decided they were sick of the cold. They were sick of not having a car. They were sick of not having a backyard. The 96 Olympics were about to happen. I hope I didn't give away my age there. But they decided to move to Atlanta, Georgia, the suburb specifically of Kennesaw, Georgia where I grew up before moving back to New York. Um, as, a, uh, as a recording artist, I go by the name Hamesha. Um, I perform with a four piece when I play live. I also perform solo. And as an artist, I've also developed installation and video. I've also composed music for dance, podcasts, and as of late, um, been doing some commissions for happy birthday songs for big fans of Hamesha. So if that is any of you or any of your family and you'd like to get them a gift, I am available to make happy birthday songs. Um, I came to uh, music, interestingly enough, like Lauren, initially as a historian. I thought I was going to become an academic of South Asian history, particularly um, Islamic South Asia. And um, 
I was working for the 1947 Partition Archive in India and Pakistan. And while I was there, I think I became really obsessed with this idea of how actual, you know, found sounds, sounds of human voices telling their own stories, sounds of Indian cities, are able to convey some kind of truth in their materiality that synthesis isn't able to. So is there a way that I can incorporate that lived reality in a sonic way in my music? Um, and if you've heard any of my music, you are able to hear that very clearly in the samples and the field recordings and everything else that's in there. So um, that that is me. That is Hamesha. And I'm guessing we are we are we are revealing our things after this. Am I correct? Correct. Yeah. Great. And I will pass it off to Ben. There we go. Trying to find the mute button. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Ben Kono. I'm a, um, a jazz saxophonist and multi woodwind uh, specialist. Um, I'm also a composer and an educator. And um, I've lived in the New York City area for over 20 years now. Uh, before that, I grew up uh, in the New England area, first in Boston. And then when I was a kid, we moved to Vermont. Uh, in a small town called Brattleboro in the southern part of Vermont. And uh, both my parents are um, of uh, immigrant descent. My, my mother is actually f an immigrant from uh, England. And uh, she came over in um, probably around the, the early 60s. Uh, my father is Japanese American, first generation, uh, second generation, sorry and um, uh, was born in Hawaii and then uh, grew up on the West Coast uh, where most of my extended family still live. Um, my career has been mostly as a, as a sideman, I suppose, uh, with a lot of different bands, touring, um, uh, a lot of Broadway theater work that over the last 20 years in, in New York City. Um, um, but like Amanda, I went to school primarily as uh, to, to become a teacher. So I have a music education degree and I just kind of followed my path and it took me through a lot of uh, sort of more of a performing journey. And um, it's only been in really the last maybe 10 years or so I've really focused more on education. And uh, so I've been teaching at City College as a uh, uh, an ensemble director and also as a uh, private saxophone and woodwind instructor there. Uh, I teach for the New York Pops uh, organization as a, uh, as a um, woodwind uh, teacher in the public schools. I give master classes uh, and as a private, private uh, instructor for saxophone. I also have my own group that I've been writing for and uh, I've received a couple of grants from Chamber Music America. Um, most recently, um, we premiered a piece in December, which we hope to record in August if uh, social distancing permits. And um, I guess that's about it. That's great. <laughs> um, thank you all for your introductions. And again, I wanted to, the first scenario that we have is for each of you to talk about an object that has comforted you comforted you during the pandemic. Um, All right, who's going first? You gonna go with Amanda? I think I was supposed to do my object right after my introduction and I forgot. So um, my item that I chose is actually um, my iPad because <laughs> I feel like this is what has kept life going since being in the pandemic. Um, this is how we've been able to connect with our friends, with our colleagues, with our peers. Um, and, you know, social media, we can still see what everybody's up to. And, you know, we can do Zoom calls and Zoom happy hours and stuff and still see each other and socialize with each other. Um, I don't know, you know, how if this pandemic had happened like 15 or 20 years ago, I don't know what that would have been like. <laughs> So that's why I picked my iPad. <laughs> um, 
I don't know how well you're going to see this. This is what I chose. This is a uh, it's a weed pulling garden utensil, and um, I yeah, that's how I've been comforting myself is by pulling weeds in our in our backyard. Um, my father was you know spent a lot of time in the garden. My grandfather spent a lot a lot of time in the garden. Uh, so I guess I'm carrying on that family tradition and working a lot in the backyard. So um, the quarantine has has gotten the yard into better shape than it would be otherwise. Do you feel like you still have, um, I don't know, can you give us a percent of how much of the yard you feel you've got conquered? It was, we moved into this house two years ago and the previous owners, I'm sorry to say, did not do a great job tending the backyard. So I feel like it's um, somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe I'm ten percent of the way where where it needs to be. I'm basically like redoing the entire the entire lawn. Um, but I have to say, you know, in terms of comfort during the pandemic, there are very few things that we feel in control of at the moment. And I think there's something about gardening, having a confined space over which I'm like the supreme dictator. And I can exercise like full authority and control over what's going on back there that I find sort of therapeutic. And so um, it's actually difficult for, for me to pull myself away sometimes. So I have to be careful, you know, that, you know, otherwise, you know, dinner might not get cooked or classes might not, online classes might not get taught or, or whatever. I, I need to be very, very careful because it's so engrossing um, as, a, as a kind of outlet and escape. Um, my object has come to me from Kennesaw, Georgia, the far foreign exotic regions of Kennesaw, Georgia, where my mother, who, especially as New York went into lockdown, insisted on sending me care packages, again, with basic things I could get at the grocery store, like dates to open my fast during Ramadan, or nuts, which I love to snack on before opening my fast, um, is this thing. Shan Masala, any of you make Indian Pakistani food and you don't use this, you are doing it wrong. This is like the golden everything for making Indian Pakistani food. And this one specifically is for a meat dish, so I, but I'm a vegetarian. Still, the spice mixes, they do the trick. Um, for this, like this one recently we've been using in like cold chickpea dish. So it's like tomatoes, chickpeas, onions, um, a little bit of tamarind, let it soak in the fridge for a long time, make sure you pepper a good amount of this on it, and you will feel like you've come back home. So thanks mom, if you're watching, for the Shan Masala. So I will fully admit that my um, object of comfort uh, is probably tied as much to addiction as uh, comfort as anything else. Um, I always start my day with a ritual cup of coffee. And uh, this cup was um, made by my mother. There was a, a period of time where she was an actual uh, potter and she used to sell her wares at uh, the local farmer's markets in, uh, in Southern Vermont. And uh, it just reminds me that um, the act of, of, of drinking coffee, other, you know, this, this time that we have right now, usually my act of drinking coffee is to grab a cup after I get out of the subway and I'm running to a rehearsal because I've had like four hours of sleep the night before and, uh, and I, I'm running low on juice. But um, now I'm getting all the sleep uh, and I can take my time in the morning. And this is, this is how it was at growing up. My parents would be, it would be like their one moment of peace, reading a book or reading the newspaper. And uh, so it's probably like the first adult thing I ever did was to drink a cup of coffee, which I clearly got from my parents. And uh, whenever I go home to see my mother, who's still in Vermont, um, we always delight uh, in uh, going through her collection of pottery to, uh, find the perfect mug, you know, it's, it's 
probably as much joy getting out of that as the buzz from the coffee. So that's my object of comfort. And this is, this is the last one that's still uh, intact, and un unfortunately, and it's, it's, the handle has been glued a number of times. So uh, just hanging on to it <laughs> as much as I can. I guess I'm struck by, I don't know if you guys want to riff on this or not, but I'm, I am struck by you all having moments of time and taking time or confined by time or different things that are going on um, because of the pandemic and um, maybe tying it into your musical and scholarly practice like does it bleed over? Does it feel different to be doing some of the things you're used to be doing now? Um, well, I just, I have so much more time for creative uh, work now. Um, I mean, the, the other part of that is uh, I have no work now. <laughs> that I have to prepare for. So as a freelance artist, uh, everything pretty much mid-March, everything just went away. So, and, and I have a lot of friends who are, are um, posting things on Facebook that they're recording and it's very, it's all very inspiring, but um, it's great. It is great to just kind of unplug out of all of that and, uh, and work on composition that I haven't had time to do because um, you're always playing other people's music and that takes a lot of time uh, or you're getting in your car or on the subway and just the commuting time into the city is draining and um, it's just it's an incredible peaceful time right now it's also very stressful because uh, I mean my last paycheck went through uh, from the university uh, last week. And so now, you know, I have to figure out what's what's going to happen uh, next fall, because uh, my workload will be less. And uh, uh, but it has given me a lot of time to work on things that I've thought for years that oh, I should really, I should really try this or try that. I started playing bass. I've never, <laughs> it's a completely for an instrument for me. So uh, it's been interesting. I do hope we go back to work soon though. I'm gonna ask Zane if, how did you come to your commissioning projects right now? People just began reaching out actually and they were like, hey, you know, like my sibling is a really big fan of yours and I feel really bad like I, I think I think she actually had had COVID-19 and on her birthday so it was really everything was just a huge bummer and um the request was just that I think this would really really make her birthday and just in general brighten things if you could do a little her happy birthday rendition Hamesha style um so for first I mean it was just a fun journey being like okay what does happy birthday look like in Hamesha style what from Hamisha Style can be brought to the happy birthday song. Um, and then it was just, it was like a very quick, quick one minute, uh, fun little ditty. And it seems like it really made their day. And then I was kind of hungry for more happy birthday projects. Uh, but similar to that, um, I think one way that this has changed my work and gotten me to reimagine what music as community looks like, music as the creative process of making music as as community um even if like i'm say there's somebody like me who writes and composes their music all alone um the process of bringing it to life with a band the process of mixing mastering the process of booking shows in the city um is all like a, a great joy and for that to have been gone for two three months has been um pretty crushing um but again riffing off the happy birthday thing i really uh, inspiring like mode of work that me and friends have begun to take on is just actually remixing one another's work. Um, even though that's not something I'm, I've been doing that much of prior to this, now it's like 
a friend has a song finished, that friend would like to hear what that song sounds like in Hamesha style. I do the same and vice versa. And there's this continuous like flow of work and creativity that still feels good even when um, you can't share space together, which is something that I think is really essential to the experience of music. Amanda or Lauren, do you have do you have any further thoughts? Um, well, usually around this time, um, it's like the bu busiest time for us. It's the end of the school year. We have all these concerts and exams and field trips and and most of the days are like you know I'm out the door by. 7 15 and I don't get home until like 10 30 at night and um and I guess I I do kind of miss all that busyness because you know even though it's super busy it's also a really exciting time um of the year because you know we're wrapping everything up and kids are about to you know go off to high school or move on to the next grade um and and I do miss all of that so much um but then on the other hand, um, like what Ben was saying, you know, you can wake up and you can enjoy your coffee in a, in a coffee mug as opposed to like a Starbucks cup. <laughs> and, um, and I mean, I guess I never thought that I would like get to do that during this time. <laughs> so that's been, that's been quite interesting. Um, but I do, I, I'm not made to stay at home. <laughs> I get, you know, really fidgety and um, I start looking for things to do. Um, but yeah, I do, I do miss the, the craziness, I guess. I would say our whole sense of time is completely warped in our house right now. I have two um, lovely children, ages, my, my daughter Maya is 15. Uh, my son Kenzo is 11 and so I feel fortunate that they're grown up enough to be more independent and I feel for those parents out there who are chasing two and three year olds uh, around all day and you know missing out on whether it's preschool or kindergarten or daycare missing out on on having that balance uh, to their lives um, but everybody here is sleeping in, staying up really late and and sleeping in um, super late. So my wife um, and, I, you know, Miko and I will, you know, not get to bed before midnight anymore. Um, and the kids for, for sure, similarly, and they could sleep, you know, forever. So I, I feel like in some ways the days have gotten very um, compressed where, you know, by the time things get going and, and they're, getting to, they're getting to their school work and I'm sitting down to, to start my work day, it's often afternoon. And, um, the day just goes by like that. And that, so, so um, yeah, all I can say is that I just feel like we're on, um, our, our relationship to time has really, has really changed. And I'm trying to sneak out into the garden, of course, to, you know, to do some weeding whenever I can, but it, it, um, it, it when, when things start to go back to, to normal or whatever that ends up meaning, I do feel like, um, it's going to be a big adjustment for for everyone in terms of our our daily routine our, our sense of rhythm with our, our relationship to time has really been transformed uh, in the last couple of months yes for sure 